Okay, everyone, uh, what I'm going to go through then is the breadth in chemistry multi-choice questions. This is if you go to Ashton Sixth Form College in the red past paper pack. So it's in the same pack that has all the January to April or May content in there. All right. This is the one that has practice written across it as well, if you're looking compared to the two, because I think the other one just has specimen across there as well. So I'm going to go through the multi-choice one at a time for this one. First question here is quite straightforward. It does have a bit of an obvious answer to it, but a couple of things about the question stood out to me. Now, this is a standard isotope question. You don't know what the element is. It's an unknown element. You're not really told, but you do know it's got two possible isotopes, isotopes A and B with very, very similar mass numbers. What I actually found quite interesting here was either you're not shown all the other isotopes that can exist, or the percentage abundance here doesn't appear to add up to 100%. Now that doesn't affect anything down here because you don't actually have to perform the calculation, but just always be mindful to check the abundance because sometimes it can be something called relative intensity. And because it's relative, it means the scale can be anything it wants to be. Just make sure in your calculation, when you do the sum of the mass to charge ratio times the percentage abundance, that before you use just 100% under here, just double check that this actually is 100% if you were doing that kind of calculation. But you don't have to here. What I do want to go through though is which is the correct answer by eliminating the others. Now here it says the relative atomic mass of the element is 47.61. You've got nowhere near enough information unless there are other isotopes or this is meant to equal um, a weird percentage also, remember, the, the actual atomic mass of the element should be an average of these two numbers in some way, and this is obviously miles away from that, so it can't be that. Isotope B has got more protons. Well, you can't have isotopes with different numbers of protons. If you change the proton number, which, remember, should be a fixed quantity for an element, then you change it into a different element, so it can't be that one. Isotope B has got fewer neutrons than isotope A. Well, look at the numbers. You can see that B has actually got a bigger number than A. So that can't be true because it's the neutrons that change in an isotope and visibly B has got a bigger number here. So it must have more neutrons. So it's not that. Relative isotopic mass of just B, so not the element um, which is the two isotopes A and B together, just B is 145. Well, that's kind of an obvious answer, so it absolutely has to be D is the correct answer here, but we've also eliminated the others based on the data we've been given. Next question. This one's a little tricky. Sometimes people really struggle with these. This is uh, trying to determine the oxidation number of vanadium in V2O7 minus. Now, it's worth pointing out, everything here with the elements adds up to four minus in terms of charge. Now the oxygen, you do know that oxygen has a common charge of two minus, and you've got seven oxygen atoms there, so you need to do seven times the two minus to find out what kind of negativity, what kind of negativeness the oxygen is contributing to this overall charge just here. And that, of course, in this case, is going to be 14 minus. Now, the difference between this number from the oxygen um, and the actual overall charge of this particular uh, compound or molecule here is 4 minus. So here the difference is going to be 10 minus just that. Now, what gets rid of those 10 minuses has got to be the vanadium. And so in order to cancel out, the charge coming from the V2 must be 10 plus. Now, V2 isn't a real thing at all because vanadium is a metal. So each vanadium must be 5 plus. And so here, the correct answer is A, like so. Top tip for this, just remember everything here is meant to add up to equal that charge. Oxygen has a common charge of 2 minus, unless it's in hydrogen peroxide, but there's an example of that shortly. Next question. So our next question here is looking at electron configuration. And it's looking at the electron configuration of a magnesium two plus ion. Now remember, if it's got a two plus charge, that means it's got two less electrons than normal. Now normal magnesium then, it's electron configuration or electronic configuration. You can actually say either one of those, it doesn't matter. Normally would be one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2. 
We can double check this because it's in the third period of the S block and it's in the second column of the S block. So that's how we can double check that just there. Now, if you take away and make this magnesium two plus, then of course you're getting rid of this just here. So what you're left with is the answer we can very easily see here, which is B. We can see that C actually is the electron configuration or the electronic configuration for normal magnesium. That's what we had here originally. And the others are just a bit random. Okay. So the correct answer here is absolutely B. Next one. Predict the shape um, and bond angle in a molecule that has two bonding pairs and two lone pairs around a central atom. Now, if you've revised this well, you know that two bond pairs and two lone pairs is actually a little bit of a clue here for H2O. That's got that combination, and we know H2O is a non-linear shape just here. Sometimes you can call this V-shaped. But notice that in a multi-choice, OCR seems to have bended towards calling it a non-linear shape. So it's worth noting that non-linear is more likely to appear in their mark schemes and in other questions as well. So our answer here has got to be B. Down here, which one of these molecules is polar? Now, before we get started, I just want to reinforce that as far as we're concerned at A-level, the CH bond is regarded to as non-polar. We do not consider the CH bond to be polar at all. And so what that means is here, the A and B molecules immediately, they cannot be polar molecules because they've got non-polar CHs and they would also have very non-polar because it's two of the same element, CC bonds. In fact, C2H4 is a double bond just there, so sorry for that. This one here doesn't have a CC bond, should mention that as well. Anyway, getting down to these two, now we can see point blank, and we know that because of the difference in electronegativity, CCL is a very polar bond. Now, this molecule here, which is actually chloromethane, has got one CCL bond, whereas this is tetrachloromethane. And so it's got no CHs whatsoever, it's entirely CCL bonds. Now, what we can say then is both of these contain polar bonds. But that does not mean that they are both automatically polar molecules. Now the CCL4, this has actually got four lots of CCL bonds and in fact that's the only type of bond it has as we've already mentioned. And what that means is the dipoles actually cancel out in their distribution around the molecule. And so what that means is this molecule, despite containing four polar bonds, actually ends up being non-polar. So it can't be this one either. However, here, if we were to look at what CH Cl, sorry, CH3Cl looks like, we can see we would have an uneven distribution of electron density just here across this bond. So we'd see that that's a polar bond. You could have made it any one of these, it doesn't really matter. And so we can see that absolutely C is our answer here because this is the only polar molecule from our selection. Moving on with the next question then. So question six. Question six here, if we're just having a look, which particles are attracted in metallic bonding? So just before we attempt the question, just want to remind ourselves what metallic bonding looks like in terms of a diagram. So we would have positive metal cations. So for example, if this was a diagram for sodium, sodium is Na+, for instance. So this was a diagram of sodium metal. We'd have all of our positive metal cations stacked together like so, and the delocalized electrons thrown around here, just sort of swimming around the outside of those. Now the attraction, therefore, isn't actually between two of the positively charged cations of sodium. It's actually between the cations and the delocalized sea of electrons. I think lots of people forget that. If we have a look down this list, we can see that the only one that really describes that well is B. Next one then. This question can be reworded a little bit. Which halogen is, uh, sorry, most readily forms one minus ions? So what are we actually trying to say here? We're trying to actually say, which is the best at accepting an extra electron? That's what we're actually trying to say. And so what we're looking for is, for these molecules, remember these would actually be the X2, 
we need to look for the smaller atoms that are involved because that means the nucleus is going to be closer to the valence shell where this extra electron will be going. And so the correct answer here has absolutely got to be fluorine because it's right at the top of group seven. Next one. This one's a little tricky one. Which statement is not correct? So what that means is three of these answers are correct. And in terms of a learning opportunity for you guys, it would be good for you to learn what the three are once you finish this question. Don't just figure out which one is not correct. Look at why the others are. Now, straight away here, we're actually going to find the one that is not correct at the very beginning. Because here, when it says which statement is not correct for the group two metals, it says there is an unpaired electron present in an S orbital. Well, if we have a look at any of the group two metals, let's pick magnesium, for instance, which we were looking at earlier. We know that magnesium is going to end in 3s2. And on a diagram, that would be 3s, and it only has one orbital box on a diagram, and it would have two electrons inside that. So we can see immediately there is no unpaired electron here. We can see that. So this has got to be the incorrect statement. So the answer is going to be A. But let's just point out these here. Chemical reactivity increases with increasing atomic number. That is actually true. Barium is more reactive. So we can say that's true. The first ionization energy decreases with increasing atomic number. That's true because barium, which has got the largest atomic number of the ones we consider, has got the smallest first ionization energy because it's got a really big atomic radius and it's subjected to more shielding. So that's correct. Atomic radius increases with increasing atomic number. I've already described that anyway. Barium is the biggest, fattest atom of that group that we consider. So it's got to be here, A. Next question, question nine. So for question nine, a bit of a weird one here because you're actually told to think of HBr as an acid, but you're not going to see this anywhere in the spec. It's not something we consider or that we study. So what we've got here to begin with is we are told it forms two ions. So what that means is the two ions from HBr have got to be, from our experience, H plus and Br minus. Now what we've got then is an acid feature, because all acids are proton donors, so they release H plus ions. And here we've got a halide ion. So what can we see here? Which station, sorry, which station, which observation is correct for reactions of HBr aqueous? So first thing we can say, it effervesces with addition of sodium carbonate solution. Well, sodium carbonate is used to detect H plus ions. Sodium carbonate will form CO2 bubbles if reacted with an acid. And since we've got an acid feature here, we actually know that this is going to be correct. So immediately I've actually found the right answer. Similar to before, I know it's going to be A. But let's have a look at why the others are incorrect because this will help us learn a bit more. It forms a white precipitate on the addition of silver nitrate solution. Well, that's wrong because it's actually a Br minus halide, so it wouldn't form a white precipitate, it would form a cream precipitate. It turns orange on addition of silver nitrate solution. Nah, that's wrong just because, no, that's not something that ever happens. It turns brown on addition of potassium chloride solution. Well, that's suggesting chloride and bromide reaction which isn't really anything and definitely no chloride with acid reaction here that would make anything of a brown solution so no there we go next question this one's quite tricky and most importantly i can honestly say that most of this is new to the 2015 specification what we're looking at here is testing for certain ions. So what I'm going to look at is what does each test seem to suggest there is and what is, what is it a test for? So first off here at the start, we can see if we heat with um, an alkali, sodium hydroxide for instance here, pungent smelling gas. Pungent smelling gas is NH3. It evolves which turns red with litmus paper blue. So it is absolutely NH3. But what was that the test for? We are getting NH3, but it was a test or NH4 plus the ammonium ion. Now that's new to your specification. I can't emphasize this enough. On addition um, of NaNO3, so remember this contains Ag plus ions, a white precipitate forms. Now the only white precipitate that would be formed would be AgCl and it would be soluble in dilute NH3. 
AGCl is soluble in dilute and concentrated NH3. It's worth pointing out that if we did have AGBr, that's only soluble in concentrated NH3, and it would actually be a cream precipitate. And AGI, that's insoluble. It's not soluble in water, obviously, because it's a precipitate anyway, but also it's not actually soluble in concentrated or dilute NH3. Finally here, on addition of, here's our carbonate again. So this was sneaky because they didn't say what the carbonate was, even though they mentioned it further up in the um, question nine we just went through. Carbonate, there is no visible reaction. Now this is actually a test for H plus ions, but since there's no visible reaction, there must be no H plus. So it can't be acidic. So then we need to look through here and what have we got? Well, first off here, ammonium bromide. Now it does have the ammonium ion and so does B. And actually, before we go any further with A and B, we can rule these two out because they don't contain the ammonium ion, which we are testing for in test one, and gives us this positive ammonia being released just here as a positive test result for ammonium ions. Ammonia, ammonium. Bromide ions here sort of wouldn't back up what's happening in test two. So we know that it can't be this one because of test two. Now, this one, ammonium chloride, we know that test one gives us the ammonium ion. We know that test two gives us this Cl minus, the chloride. And we also know test three says that there should be no H plus and we can't see any H plus there at all. So our correct answer has got to be B. Just a little bit more information here. We know that it couldn't be test, uh, sorry, we know that it couldn't be C because of test three. So test three said there was no acid in here, but we can obviously see that there is some acid feature just there. And here for sodium chloride, just down here, we've got absolutely nothing here which would back up for test one because there's no ammonium ion, there's no NH4 plus demonstrated inside here at all.